Good day everyone, this is Professor Friday coming at you one more time. I've had a special request today for a composition of some trigonometric and inverse trigonometric functions. So what I have for you today is we're going to find the sine of the inverse sine of negative four-fifths plus the inverse tangent of five-twelfths. Something that I emphasize to my trigonometry students is whenever I give you one of these things with compositions, with sines and inverse sines and tangents and inverse tangents, cosines, whatever, am I giving you a ratio or am I giving you an angle and as a result what is the function supposed to be popping out so for the inverse sine function and inverse tangent function you are going to be given a ratio as a result once we plug that into one of these inverse trigonometric functions it is going to output an angle so here's what we're going to do with this I'll switch over to red here that means that this whole quantity this inverse sine of negative four-fifths, that is going to be an angle. And I'm going to refer to this first angle as the angle alpha. Now for this guy over here, inverse tangent of five-twelfths, we input a ratio, we output another angle, and this guy I'm going to refer to this as beta. So now we have changed the problem into the following. We are now asked to find the sine of alpha plus beta. And this is where alpha is equal to the inverse sine of negative four-fifths and beta is equal to the inverse tangent of five-twelfths. Now, before we proceed any further, the reason that I wanted to write it in this form is because sine of alpha plus beta now looks like one of our sum identities that we've been learning recently. So this is sine of alpha cosine of beta plus cosine alpha sine of beta. Now, I don't really care that much about what alpha and beta are, like as far as a degree measure or radian measure or whatever. The only thing I'm really concerned about is what is the sine and the cosine of each of these angles. If we can figure out those pieces of information, we are solid. We know everything that we're supposed to know. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this expression with alpha and I'm going to express this in terms of a sine rather than an inverse sine. So this is telling me that the sine of alpha is equal to negative four-fifths. This guy over here I'm going to do the same thing and eventually I'm going to draw a nice little picture and this is that the tangent of beta is equal to five-twelfths. Now both of these ratios are based on our inverse sine and inverse tangent functions though so that is immediately going to give us information about in what quadrant am I going to be drawing these angles. So the fact that sine of alpha is negative would normally indicate that alpha is a quadrant 3 or a quadrant 4 angle. But the angle restriction for the inverse sine is that alpha has to be in between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So with that in mind, we uh, sometimes refer to that as alpha is restricted to quadrant 1 and quadrant 4. So quadrant 1 if the ratio is positive, quadrant 4 if the ratio is negative, and in this case it happens to be. So this will be our angle alpha. We'll draw on a reference triangle like so. A little right angle right here. <clears throat> and the ratio that we were given is the sine. We know from Sokotoa that would be opposite over hypotenuse. So from the reference angle that we have here, this would be our opposite side is 4, hypotenuse is 5. Given that we're in quadrant 4, though, it is guaranteed that our 4 is going to be negative. The y value should be negative down in quadrant 4. Now this allows us to solve for our other side. Uh, some of you probably recognize this triangle. Uh, we'll say a squared plus b squared is equal to r squared. So a squared plus negative 4 squared is equal to 25. This tells us that a squared is equal to 9. Now this would imply that a has to be equal to plus or minus 3. Now you'll be using what quadrant we're in to determine whether that side should be positive or negative. From the perspective of the origin, we move to the right to get our x-coordinate, so that would have to be a positive value. So like I said just a moment ago, the only two things that I'm really interested in for this angle are what is the sine <coughs> Oh, excuse me. And what is the cosine? 
Now sine was a quantity given to us, that's negative 4 fifths. The cosine we can now interpret as adjacent over hypotenuse. We'll call that 3 fifths. So now we officially know everything there is to know about alpha that we care to know about for this problem. I'm going to do the same thing for beta. Now for beta, we were given that the tangent of beta is equal to 5 twelfths. Now the fact that the uh, ratio is positive means that for the tangent we would normally be restricted to quadrant 1 and quadrant 3. But the angle restriction on beta, given that we have an inverse tangent function, is that beta has to be in between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. As a result, we sometimes say that beta is restricted to quadrants 1 and 4, just like for the sine. Now, given that the ratio is positive, though, anytime we talk about inverse functions, if I give you a positive ratio, you can always assume that the angle is going to be a quadrant 1 angle. That is kind of a nice thing about positive ratios. So this is the opposite over the adjacent side. So from the perspective of our angle beta, that gives us the opposite side and the adjacent side. That would be 5 twelfths. Again, we're in quadrant 1, so both of these quantities will be positive. Then we can use our Pythagorean theorem one more time to figure out the one side that we don't know. 5 squared plus 12 squared, that's going to be r squared. That would be 25 plus 144. And if we add those together, we get 169. This implies that r would be equal to the square root of 169. That is a nice number. Now, on the previous problem, we had to pose the question, is a going to be positive or is a going to be negative? Over here, we don't need to pose that question for r. You may always assume, for purposes of these problems, that r is going to be a positive value. If you study polar coordinates, that is not necessarily true. Our class will get to that in chapter 10. That'll be good times. So now that we have this picture, we can determine what is the sine of beta and what is the cosine of beta, as those are the only two things that we care about for our formula up here. So sine of beta, this would be the opposite over the hypotenuse, that would be 5 thirteenths, and the cosine of beta, that would be adjacent over hypotenuse, that'll be 12 thirteenths. Throw in that little equal sign. So now, I officially have all of the information that I need about both alpha and beta. What I'm going to do is recopy the problem that we're actually supposed to be doing right now, and then we'll simply fill in the ratios as is necessary. So we had turned the problem into sine of alpha plus beta, and according to our formula, that was the sine of alpha times the cosine of beta plus cosine of alpha times the sine of beta. Every single one of those ratios is a ratio that I now know. Sine of alpha, that is equal to negative 4 fifths. Cosine of beta, that was equal to 12 thirteenths. Plus cosine of alpha, that was equal to 3 fifths. And sine of beta, that was equal to 5 thirteenths. Now something I tell my trig students at this point, you'll notice over here that we could cancel out the fives. We are not going to, because you'll notice that with the denominators, we've got a 5 times 13 and a 5 times 13. That means that we already have a common denominator of 5 times 13, that is 65. We don't want to ruin that if we can help it. Multiplying the numerators, we'll get negative 48 65ths and 15 65ths, and upon adding those together, we get a final answer of negative 33 65ths. This is our final answer. That's why I threw it in a box. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you for the request. Keep sending them in.